Good evening, Mr. Ramchandra Guha. The few sentences which I, in which I was mentioning, I was capturing the vacuum, the deep vacuum left behind by Mr. Virendra Kumar, and how his presence continues to lead us through the tumultuous times. It's a strange coincidence, sir, that on his second death anniversary, we witnessed the inaugural of the new parliament, where disproportionate showcasing of Hindutva was presented. In your words, Mr. Guha, the Hindufication of Indian politics. It was a deep concern for Mr. Virendra Kumar as well. In our evening meetings, where that's where when you entered, he used to ask us, where are we headed? Where is this country headed? So, Sri Guha, we have selected that topic, which was the constant question asked by Mr. Virendra Kumar. And the historical relevance of today is that from today, in a week's time, we would know the result of this elections, the ongoing the campaign which will end now. And the result, the outcome of the elections is sure to script a new chapter in the 76-year-old country. And the news that reaches us today is that the Prime Minister is going to meditate on the Vivekananda Rock on 30th and 31st, on the eve of the final phase of polling, which you know, sir, perfectly underlines the Hindufication of politics. And knowing the deep relation between Swami Vivekananda and Sri Virendra Kumar, this again, if he were alive today, he would have cried from the top of his voice, where is India headed? So we await to hear from you that discourse, sir. Please welcome Sri Ramchandra Guha. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for, for being here and for your patience and your understanding. I was booked on a 12.30 flight this morning and uh, this afternoon, and it got cancelled, uh, which is the reason I'm late, and uh, I deeply apologize, but it was beyond my control. Uh, I'm greatly honored to be here this evening to speak in memory of MP Virendra Kumar, uh, writer, scholar, socialist activist, institution builder, and though we never met, I have the great privilege of uh, writing for uh, uh, the weekly with which he's associated. And as I said, we never met, but we did have one common friend uh, who was you are Anantamurti. And I know Anantamurti had enormous fondness for Mr. Virendra Kumar. Uh, and uh, Anantamurti was a kind of a bridge between many people. You know, he was a very unusual man. I mean, you know him. Uh, we know him as the preeminent Kannada writer and uh, public intellectual in, in, in the state of Karnataka. You know him because for a few years, we gifted you, uh, gifted Anantamurti to your state when he was vice chancellor of uh, Mahatma Gandhi University. And he was a person of, uh, the two things about him that I remember was his warmth, his generosity, and his absolute lack of hierarchy. You know, uh, he was more than 25 years older than me. But we could argue as equals. And I think that's something of the spirit, I'm sure, of uh, that socialist tradition to which uh, Virendra Kumar and Anantamurti belonged, that it was about conversation debate, not talking down, you know, very different from uh, the kind of political culture of today. So I... <coughs> titled my talk, Where is India Headed? And the bulk of my talk will focus on the challenges that our country faces today. You know, we are going through, uh, we are in the last phases of a very long, very extended, uh, very complicated and uh, uh, I would say bitter gender election campaign. And in a few days, 
the results will be known. But regardless of who wins, this country will be faced with a series of uh, major challenges that the incumbent government will have to deal with. So I will come to those challenges. But before I come to those challenges, I want to say a little bit about the history of our republic. You know, when we became independent in 1947, few Intelligent observers thought we would survive as an independent country, let alone as a democratic political system. We were very large, we were very diverse, uh, we were desperately poor, uh, and predictions of doom, predictions that India would fall apart, began the day Mahatma Gandhi was murdered on 30th January 1948. And some senior British officials thought they would have to come back and run India because India was incapable of ruling itself. And all through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, you had uh, these kind of forecasts that either democracy will fail and India will come, become a military dictatorship, or there will be savage civil war between different castes and communities, and we will become you know, uh, just a land of terrible conflict, endemic conflict, or there'll be mass scarcity and famine because people thought Indians could, feed could not feed themselves. So essentially, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, many intelligent, knowledgeable observers who were sympathetic about India, including many Indians themselves. That is why so many middle-class Indians voted with their feet and migrated to other countries. They thought this experiment of a united and democratic India will not survive. And I, I live in uh, Bangalore, which is uh, uh, the startup capital of India. So I sometimes uh, uh, joke that if India was a startup in 1947, no one would have invested in it because it was destined to fail. Now, but we didn't fail. We survived, uh, you know, in a, in a recent uh, column, I, I wrote about how uh, in the early, day, early years of independence, we were able to forge both an emotional unity and a territorial unity. Then we adopted a constitution. Uh, then we embarked on our uh, journey as an independent nation. We had regular elections, and particularly since economic liberalization in 1991, also three decades of impressive economic growth. So before I come to the challenges India faces, I want to just briefly refresh our memories and our, our minds uh, with some understanding of why we have survived as an independent, united, and somewhat democratic country, and we have vanquished the specter of mass famine. You know, uh, in this, particularly in the early 60s, after there was a war with China, a war with Pakistan, uh, successive failures of the monsoon, serious famine conditions, people just thought there's no chance for India at all to make it. Now, why have we made it? Why are we here today? Why have I come here from Bangalore to speak to you in memory of MP Virendra Kumar? So there are really two main reasons why India has stayed united for 76 and a half years, has vanquished mass poverty, uh, has not known breakaways like uh, pa Pakistan, where Bangladesh is broken away. It has not even known a civil war of the Sri Lankan kind. And, and there are two main reasons for this. For a modest success, I underline the modest because I'll talk about the problems we face in a little while. So the two main reasons are, first, the quality of the individuals who founded our republic. If no new nation was born in more difficult circumstances, no new nation had such a great galaxy of leaders at its founding. Uh, and I'm just going to mention four of them. And I'm going to begin with Nehru and Patel. You know, the politics of today, of 2024, presents them as rivals. But that is far from the truth. 
They had their differences, they had their disagreements, but they worked together for 25 years in the freedom struggle. And crucially, after Gandhi's martyrdom, in uniting India and giving it a democratic template. Uh, Nehru provided the emotional integration. Nehru was a Hindu who was trusted by Muslims, or North Indian who uh, had a deep understanding of South India, and, a, and not, in some ways, perhaps the most important thing in a patriarchal society like us, Nehru was a man who stood for gender equality. And in this, he was like Gandhi, and like no one else. If you look at the whole galaxy of uh, major Congress leaders, they were basically North Indian men, Hindu men, with a few exceptions. So Nehru provided the emotional integration. You know, particularly after partition, uh, he, he assured the Muslim and Christian minority in India that they would have equal rights. He assured women that they would have the same rights as men. Uh, he reached out to the young. He had a special rapport with the young. So Nehru provided the emotional integration. And Patel oversaw and supervised the territorial integration through bringing 500 princely states that had fragmented our country on board, largely peacefully. Now, so, and they really worked as a team. Theirs was a partnership, a jugalbandi, if I may use a Hindi word. And it was the greatest of partnerships. It was far, you know, in recent decades, we have had several very important partnerships of two people in Delhi controlling the central government uh, and really determining the course of the nation. Two powerful individuals in Delhi with the power and the authority to decide what happens everywhere, including in Kerala. These jugalbandis or these partnerships include the partnership between Indira Gandhi and her close advisor P. N. Haksar, between Vajpayee and Advani, between Manmohan Singh and Sonia Gandhi, and as we speak, between Narendra Modi and Amit Shah. And if you compare the first partnership, Nehru and Patel, with any of these others, you can see the difference in what the good and the benefit they brought to our country. Without Nehru and Patel, there would have been no united India, no democratic India. But there were two other individuals who played absolutely critical roles in those early years when no one thought India would survive. One was the great B.R. Ambedkar, who, uh, you know, like Nehru, was passionately committed to gender equality. Unlike Nehru, was born, born in a Dalit home. Nehru was born in an affluent Brahmin home. Ambedkar had known uh, uh, suffering, discrimination personally. He was a great scholar, uh, a constitutional expert, and he, of course, played the most important role in drafting the Constitution. And the fourth person I'll mention, because she's largely forgotten today, is Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay, who, in my view, was the greatest Indian woman of modern times, far greater than Indira Gandhi. Kamala Devi was the first Indian woman to fight an election. First of all, she was married. She had an arranged marriage as a young, as was the practice in, at that time. She was born in a Brahmin family up the coast from where we are, you know, in Takshin Karana, in what is now Karnataka. And she lost her husband early. She was a child widow. But she persuaded her mother that she would go to Madras and study. And she married again. She had an intercaste marriage. She is the first Indian woman to stand for an election in the 1920s for a municipal seat in Madras. Then she became a passionate feminist. She was one of the moving spirits of the All India Women's Conference. Uh, she was, played a major role in the SALT March. She was the founder of the Congress Socialist Party. Uh, she, after independence, she resettled the refugees and, of course, went on to do fundamentally important work in reviving and renewing our craft traditions. The whole cooperative movement, the revival of Indian crafts, uh, its great diverse heritage of Indian crafts, finding an urban and international market for it was done by Kamla Devi. So there were many other remarkable individuals who built our republic. They were individuals working silently, selflessly in every state. And it's because of the caliber of those 
founding fathers and mothers that India uh, was saved from di dictatorship, destitution, and civil war. The second reason for uh, the survival of India and its moderate success is the constitution we adopted. And this constitution had four fundamental features. The first is multi-party democracy based on universal add-on franchise. And I underline the universal. Uh, as soon as we got independence in 47, and we adopted a constitution, every adult, regardless of education or income or gender, was given the vote. If you look at Western democracies, there was a limited franchise. To begin with, only rich men got the vote. Then educated men were added on. And it was only after a long struggle by women that they were given the right to vote. So the first element aspect of this constitution was universal adult franchise, uh, multi-party democracy based on universal adult franchise. The second aspect of the revolutionary aspect of this constitution was a commitment to religious and linguistic pluralism. Again, this was absolutely revolutionary. If you look at how European nations were formed in the 19th century, citizens of a particular territory were united on the basis of a common language and a common religion and a common enemy. So to be properly English, you had to speak the English language, you had to belong to the Protestant branch of the Christian church, and you had to hate the French. To be French, you had to speak French, no other dialect, no other language. You had to be a Catholic, not a Protestant, and you had to hate the British. So the model of nationalism, actually Pakistan in some ways, at its founding, was a perfect European nation, founded that on the belief that every citizen will be a Muslim, and every citizen will speak Urdu. But in India, on the other hand, we gloried in a religious and linguistic diversity. We said, you do not have to be a Hindu to be a patriotic Indian, and you certainly don't have to speak Hindi. And the reason for, the reason for our adopting this very revolutionary and innovative model of not defining nationalism by religion or language, but allowing all languages and religions to flourish, it really goes back to Gandhiji's experience in South Africa, where he worked with Indians of different communities. The third radical aspect of our constitution was a commitment to ending caste and gender discrimination. We were, of course we still remain, but particularly in 1947, we were a deeply unequal society. Discrimination against Dalits was akin to slavery. And actually in Kerala, in some ways, back in the first half of the 20th century, it was even worse than in some other states of India, some other parts of India. And of course, discrimination against women was widely practiced. In both Hinduism and Islam, uh, in their scriptures, women were treated as inferior. In their social practice, even more. So our constitution was revolutionary because it said, we are going to, at least legally, at least formally, end caste and gender discrimination. And finally, the fourth critical aspect of our constitution was the respect for the rights of states. You know, and this goes with a respect for linguistic and religious diversity. That all the different states of the union uh, must have great autonomy in their functioning. There are some powers that are with the center, some powers that are with the states, some powers that are shared, but the, the states will have their own elected governments, and within their sphere, they will have not complete, but substantial economy in determining their affairs. Now, these four elements of our constitution, which can be collapsed into two basic ideas, democ or three basic ideas, democracy, equality, and pluralism. Those have kept India together. Now, we have stayed somewhat united. We have made considerable strides in 
reducing poverty, and we hold multi-party elections. As I said, in the first few decades of our freedom, because of the enormous problems we faced, because never before had a land so diverse and divided been constituted as a single nation, never before had a population so poor and illiterate been run on democratic lines, people thought we would fail. People thought we were going down the tube. Now, suddenly, in about the year 2007, when uh, we celebrated our 60th anniversary of independence, we found a different set of tunes being sung about India. No longer was it said that we are a failed polity, a failed society. We were told we are a rising superpower. We are poised to replace and supplant China. And the success of our IT industry, based in my hometown, Bangalore, was offered as particular proof of our coming, of our coming rise to global prominence. At this, in 2006, the World Economic Forum, held at Davos, announced that India was the rising superpower. This is well before the Vishgu, Vishwaguru stuff you are hearing now, which is actually a continuation of that kind of talk. So, and now we are told in, this, in the current regime that we are going to lead the world. We are the Vishwaguru. Now, are these anticipations of global greatness justified by the evidence? Or might they be just as premature as those past anticipations of our descent into starvation and anarchy? What, certainly one remarkable achievement which we should be proud of is that we have held 18 general elections. You know, when the first general election was held in 1952, the Amer American ambassador to India wrote at the time, after the first general election, I quote, a poll of 200 million eligible voters, most of them illiterate, is the biggest farce ever staged in the name of democracy anywhere in the world. And it was expected that first election would be the last. But we've held 17 since. And also regular assembly elections. And of course, in Kerala, they are really always very hotly contested. And in the first general election, there were 170 million registered voters. In this general election that we are about to conclude, there are six times as many, almost 1,000 million voters. Uh, so. In a few days, we'll know the result of, you know, uh, who is going to rule us. But in the concluding part of my talk, I'm going to focus on the challenges the incumbent government will face. I'm going to offer a reality check to the belief, which is quite widespread among India's political elite, India's business elite, and possibly even among media's elite, India's media elite quite widespread that India is going to rule, lead the world, that it's going, to be, it's, a, it's going to be a superpower to match China and America. I'm going to offer a reality check. I'm going to suggest to you that despite all our impressive achievements in keeping this nation together, in holding regular elections, in not having a civil war, in also experiencing steady economic growth that has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, and that's not a small achievement, we still face some major challenges. And I'm going to list six challenges in particular. The first set of challenges are political. And by this I mean the decline and degradation of the party system. Now, in any mature democracy, Parties are supposed to have internal democracy. How does the leader of a party emerge? Through competition at the lower ranks, through debate and discussion at the lower ranks. Uh, and how does a leader once chosen function? Through democratic consultation. He or she consults their colleagues, their subordinates, the district units, the state units, and that's how they function. So in a 
properly democratic system, and such systems do exi exist, particularly in Western Europe, and I'll give an example in a minute. Parties, political parties, have leaders who are freely chosen and who are accountable to their colleagues. In India, on the other hand, we have only two types of political parties. One type that is captive to a cult of personality. You know, uh, uh, Narendra Modi uh, thinks he's God. And many of his followers also think he's God. Now, this Narendra Modi has created the greatest personality cult in the history of the world. And you are all quite familiar with that. And I suspect most of you are uncomfortable with that. So I see, let me say no more about that, except to remind you that maybe in this state also you have a cult of personality around your chief minister. Uh, maybe he is a Modi, Modi in a Mundu. Maybe, maybe he is. I know some of you are protesting, but maybe he is. Maybe Mamta Bairiji is a Modi in a Sari. Kejriwal is a Modi in a Bushat. Namit Patlaik is a Modi in a White Dhoti. These are all partly true. They, it may be the, the disbelief on some supporters of Pinaray Vijayan here. I will make the same belief if, disbelief if I criticize Modi in Gujarat. If I was to criticize Modi in Gujarat, more people will say, no, 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 no. But it is true that at this, we, and Dr. Ambedkar warned about this. In his last speech to the Council Assembly, he said that bhakti in religion is a route to the salvation of the soul. Bhakti in politics is a route to dictatorship. And there is a cult, certainly, Mr. Vijayan, I can say, and I have some experience of this state. I come here quite often. I study its politics. I can say confidently, and I hope this is reported in tomorrow's newspaper, because it is a historian speaking. I can say confidently, <coughs> Mr. Vijayan is the most authoritarian and dictatorial communist chief minister in Indian history, much more than EMS, than Mr. Nayanar, much more than Jyoti Basu, much more than Malik Sarkar. Just compare. Likewise, uh, you know, Mamta, so I, that, that's an objective fact. And Mamta is a completely arbitrary dictator. Her world rules. Her cabinet is pygmies. Kejriwal, you are all seeing. So they are all Bini Modis. So we have one kind of, a Jagan Reddy in Andhra is also a kind of Mini Modi. So we have one kind of political party, in which there is a personality cult around the leader, Hello, He knows all. He will decide all. Everyone else is a pygmy in his cabinet and in his party. And the other kind of political party is a family firm, controlled by one family. Uh, now, there is nothing wrong with people following their parents' profession. But there is something wrong if you go immediately to the top. Now, a lawyer's child is a lawyer, but they'll have to start at a trial court. And if their clients like them, if they built up a good reputation, you know, they will progress in their career. A doctor's child can become a doctor. Uh, but if they botch up their operations, a famous doctor's child who botches up his or her first operation is not likely to succeed. There's a reason why Amjad Ali Khan, the great Sarod player, his children are not as well known as him, even though he promoted them. Right. There's a reason why Arjun Tendulkar is not as successful as Sachin Tendulkar, though Sachin Tendulkar did whatever he could to, pro to promote him. On the other hand, Priyanka Gandhi joins the Congress party today as general secretary of the party. Right. Now, what does this say to the ordinary party worker? The ordinary party worker say, I'll do the same thing. So if Priyanka, Rahul, and Sonia can be the top leadership of the Congress party, then Mr. Kharge says, we'll say, my son, will, I will be pres nominally president, though answerable to the Gandhis. But I will also then make my son a minister in Karnataka, and I will give a Lok Sabha seat to my son-in-law. And of course, this is true of uh, Bihar in the RJD, and I know that there are RJD connections in this room, so let me criticize the RJD too. There are eight members of the other family in politics. Now, 
this is completely antithetical to democracy, the cult of personality and family firms. This is not how political parties function. Now you compare the Indian situation with Britain. We are, sub we, have supposed to, we are supposed to have adopted their, their model of uh, politics, the model of democracy, and Britain is going to have an election in July, right? There are two major leaders, Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer. Neither comes from a political family. They're completely self-made. There's no cult of personality around them. No one is saying, you know, uh, uh, Rishi, Rishi Sunak is a non-biological person. If Rishi Sunak loses the election, he will be re replaced by someone who is not called Sunak. He will quietly go. So if you contrast the degradation of our party system, how it has been contaminated by personality, cults, and family capture of political parties, with how a properly democratic system should function, you will know what I'm saying. Right. That's the first challenge we face. Our party system is not what Nehru, Patel, Ambedkar, Kamla Devi wanted it to be. Because they wanted internal democracy. They wanted accountability. They wanted leaders who could uh, take advice, who were open to criticism, who did not think they are demigods, and who did not pass on their power to their children. So that is the first challenge we face, which is why, in this respect, in terms of the functioning of our party system, we are really a seriously imperfect democracy. The second challenge we face is the degradation of our institutions. Now, in this, in this ongoing election, you have seen how partisan the election commission has been. Uh, you will, and it's the, it was evident in the scheduling of, it was evident in the scheduling of, you know, of the polls itself. Tamil Nadu has 39 seats, and Tamil Nadu, the voting was in one stage. Maharashtra has 48 seats, the voting was in five stages. Why? Because in Tamil Nadu, the BJP knows that Modi cannot win any seats. But in Maharashtra, they have a chance, so he wants to give 18 talks there. Okay, now, so the election commission, you have seen how the hatred, the communal hatred, uh, you know, uh, articulated by, by, uh, by, by Modi uh, and by Shah has gone unpunished. So, the election commission is compromised, the civil service and the police is compromised, regulatory institutions are compromised, those who those who, uh, <coughs> those who are supposed to abide by the rules, by the constitution, actually obey their political masters. Uh, then the threats to the freedom of expression, I mean the media. Fortunately, in Kerala, you don't have a Godi media. I mean, uh, while coming here, I was very heartened. Uh, I was talking to one of, one of your, the person who picked me up, and I was very heartened that even Matrubhumi and uh, Mano Manorama, you know, which are the two major uh, new media houses, have a relationship in which a writer can write here and write there. If you write for the Times of India, uh, you know, you can't write for the Hindustan Times, and vice versa. So the attack, the undermining of the independence of the institutions and of the media is our second challenge, that our institutional challenges are so serious. The third set of challenges would be economic challenges. Again, you are know about this, crony capitalism, the fact that uh, we are, uh, as someone, as a former chief, chief economic, economic advisor, a former chief economic advisor, Arvind Subramanian, to the government of India, talked about a 2A model of stigmatized capitalism, Adani and Ammani. Actually, it is Atta. It is Adani, Tata, and Ammani. Because the Tatas also get many preferential uh, contracts from this government. And then there's a problem of jobless growth. I mean, you are all familiar with the great unemployment. And of course, this state at least has an escape route. Uh, you can send your people to the Gulf. You know, you can send your clever, educated people who can't get jobs in Kerala to the Gulf. But what do people in Bihar and UP do? 
they join right-wing vigilante organizations because they have nowhere to go. One other aspect of our economic model, which is uh, really calls into question any claim that we are an economic superpower, is the abysmally low rate of female participation in the workforce. You know, it's, uh, it's about 33%, whereas even Bangladesh has more than 50%. And any mature society, I mean, fortunately, Kerala is an exception, and Kerala is an outlier in many respects, but nationally, crony capitalism, large-scale unemployment among young people, and low rates of female participation, I think, uh, are major challenges that we will have to face. The fourth kind of challenge we face is the environmental crisis. Now, I live in Bangalore, which we are told is the showpiece of our economy with, uh, with the IT industry. But it has an endemic water crisis, and we just don't have enough water for our growing population. And we have no way to solve it. You know, Bangalore, when Bangalore was established in the 18th century, it got water from 70 lakes in the city. Then it grew. And then it had to go to two reservoirs outside the city. Then it grew further. And then it had to go to the Kaveri, which is 60 miles away. And water had to be pumped up uh, 2,000 feet uh, with great um, you know, use of, misuse of energy. Uh, now it's growing further. And we are told we will go to the Sharavati, which is in the Western Ghats, to meet our water resources. Now, what kind of sustainable model is this? That is Bangalore, you know, uh, the showpiece of our economic growth. Move to Delhi, our capital, and it has the highest rates of air pollution in the world. You know, I am a lifelong asthmatic, so I carry this inhaler with me every day. But in Delhi, a six-month-old child needs this inhaler. Apart, and it is not just water scarcity in our cities or air pollution in our cities you will find that our rivers are biologically dead. There's a massive depletion of groundwater aquifer in the Punjab, which was once uh, our rice bowl and our wheat bowl. Farmers have to dig deeper and deeper for water. And when they do, they will find the water contaminated by chemicals. Now, all these environmental problems that we face exact a major economic cost. They affect our health our livelihood, our employment, uh, our, you know, our safety. And they are all occurring independent of climate change. That climate change makes all of this worse. Kerala, you have experienced climate change. You know what happens, you know, when there's unprecedented uh, rain and, you know, the, uh, when the floods come and uh, there's a cyclone and, uh, and so on and so forth. But mm, even if climate change did not exist, we are confronted with manifold environmental problems which exact a very high economic and social cost. So I've listed four major challenges we face, and I'll list two more. But before I do, let me remind you of these four challenges. First, the decline and degradation of the party system. Second, the capture of institutions by ruling party politicians. So the civil service, the police, the election commission, the reserve bank, none of these are truly independent, possibly even the courts, certainly not the media. Third, economic challenges, the challenge of unequal growth, uh, rising inequality, cloning capitalism, high rates of unemployment. And fourth, the manifold environmental challenges I have briefly outlined. Now these four challenges, the political challenge, the institutional challenge, the economic challenge and the environmental challenge were all there before 2014. They were not created by the Modi regime. Many of these are the product of mismanagement, corruption, uh, incompetence on the part of the Congress governments in Delhi that preceded it. But a fifth challenge is more recent and can be more directly attributed to the party that is, has been in power over the last uh, 10 years. And this is, the, this is the rise of Hindu majoritarian sentiments, you know, which was, has already been mentioned uh, by the gentleman who spoke before me. And the growing influence of Hindu majoritarian sentiments 
on politics, institutions, social interactions, and everyday life. For the last few weeks, Mr. Modi has been, and of course, Mr. Amit Shah, and others, uh, Arunag Thakur, Himanto Biswa Sarma, who may have the most uh, filthy tongue of any living politician in our country, maybe even exceeding that of Modi and Shah, these politicians of the BJP have been vilifying, demonizing, uh, stigmatizing Muslims day in and day out. Today, Mr. Modi went a day further and attacked Christians in Jharkhand. And this should not surprise you, you know, if you, any of you know the history of the RSS and the BJP. Uh, you know, they hate Christians almost as much as they hate Muslims. That is a core part of their ideology. They believe that this must be a Hindu Rashtra, this must be a Hindu Pakistan. And this has become, this is always there. Mr. Modi is a brilliant actor, you know, uh, uh, and uh, a much greater actor than anyone in, or a much more skillful actor than anyone in, uh, in, uh, in Bollywood. But when he's in trouble, his innate ideology comes out. You know, uh, as I was listening to someone on, on social media joking, that when you're in trouble, what do we say? You know, we, we remember our mother or our father. We'll say, amma da, appa da, or whatever, hey, mere bhai baat. Modi will say, Hindu Muslim, Hindu Muslim, when he's in trouble, at least for that, right. And so the real Modi is coming out, and it's very widespread, and it is deeply worrying for India, because if there is a lesson from Pakistan and Sri Lanka, it is, or if you look at our, not just Pakistan and Sri Lanka, if you look at our neighborhood, Pakistan and Bangladesh are Islamic majoritarian states where Hindus, Christians are second class citizens. If you look at Sri Lanka, it is a Buddhist majoritarian state where Hindus and, Christ and Muslims are second class citizens. If you look at Myanmar, it is a Buddhist majoritarian state where there has been widespread persecution, almost close to genocide of the Rohingya Muslim minority. And all these countries have suffered. Now, in Sri and let me just stick with the example of Sri Lanka, because Sri Lanka is very close to you in Kerala. And Sri Lanka is very like Kerala in many respects, in many admirable respects. Like Kerala, uh, it has very high levels of, you know, uh, cleanliness and hygiene and sanitation compared. Kerala in these respects is much better than the rest of India. Like Kerala, it had very high levels of female education, you know, uh, declining property, women's control over their body, decent education. Like Kerala, it had a thriving tourism industry. And all this was destroyed by Buddhist majoritarianism. When in the 1960s and 70s, the Buddhists said, we want to suppress the Tamils. We are scared of the Tamils. They are taking away our jobs. We have to crush them. Uh, we have to humiliate them. We have to show them that they are second-class citizens. And this is, a this is a land for Buddhists and for Sinhala speakers first, and for everyone else much later. They destroyed their economic chances. You know, if Kerala, if Sri Lanka had not had a civil war, it might have been, uh, it might have been one of the most economically successful countries in all of Asia. It could have been like Korea and Taiwan, because it had high levels of education, high levels of gender equality, uh, an open society, wonderful opportunities for tourism, uh, you know, and, and educated intelligentsia, and it blew it all away because of Buddhist majoritarianism. So more than Pakistan, which adopted Islamic bigotry very early in the 50s, Sri Lanka, which has adopted Buddhist Chauvinism, chauvinism, relatively late, is a cautionary example for us. Do we want to go the way of Sri Lanka? And the last challenge, and then I'll conclude, is the growing North-South divide. Now, is it an accident that this too, like the, this is linked to uh, the rise of Hindu majoritarianism, it is relatively recent. Is it an accident that the BJP is not in power in any of the five southern states? Surely not. Why is it not in power? Uh, because in the south, so far, we have had 
far less appetite for religious fundamentalism, for linguistic chauvinism. Uh, we are societies in the South that value education more, where women are more emancipated. We have a more outward-looking attitude towards trade and the outside world because we are coastal cultures. We are not xenophobic, only thinking about ourselves, not only saying Aryavarta and Hindus are great. We are willing to learn uh, from other cultures, other parts of the world. And this, but we ha don't have economic power, don't have political power. We have economic heft. We are economically more dynamic than the states of the North. We are socially more progressive. We are culturally more inclusive. I mean, and Kerala is a great example uh, because of your religious diversity. But if you think of my state, Karnataka, in one respect, we are superior to you, which is in our linguistic diversity. In Bangalore, you have daily film shows in six languages. All the four southern languages, Tamil, Kannada, Telugu, and Malayalam, and Hindi, and English. And when I go for my walk, uh, every day for my morning walk in Kaman Park, and because it's not a BJP rule state, I haven't been disturbed on my morning walk so far, so far uh, you'll find, you'll have Konkani being spoken, which is also a language of Karnataka, Dakhani being spoken, which is also a language of Karnataka, you'll hear Tulu being spoken, and of course you'll be hear the languages of the migrants, you'll hear Gujarati and Sindhi and Punjabi and Bengali and Odia. And I think these are the aspects of the South that somehow go against Hindutva, which wants religious and linguistic homogeneity, which wants uh, to stoke hatred and animosity, does not want to give hope and uh, you know, uh, uh, economic growth and technological dynamism. Now, the North-South divide is there, it's visible. It's there in how the, how the BJP uh, treats the southern states, in who it, who it sends as governors of states ruled by non-BJP parties. You know, one of the most dis distasteful, distasteful and less noticed, uh, I won't call it a crime, but one of the most vindictive things that this, the Modi government has done is wherever there's a state ruled by the opposition, they've sent a governor whose main job is to stop the work of the state government. That is true in Kerala, that is true in Tamil Nadu, that is true in West Bengal, that was true in Maharashtra when the opposition was in power, that's true in Punjab, certainly. Uh, and I think that is the kind of, this is really, this is, particularly the South, I think this creates a great deal of resentment. It was also true in, in Telangana. Now, the North-South divide is there, it will grow, and it will grow more if there is a fresh uh, delimitation of seats in 2026. Now, as you know, all of you would be aware of this, that there is a proposal to reallocate seats on the basis of population. When the proposal came up in 2001, the government then in power sensibly postponed it for 25 years. So it will come up again in 2026. And then the question is, what will the government do? If it is sensible, uh, it has two options, if it's sensible. One is, it will postpone it further, because what you're doing uh, is you're rewarding the poorly performing states with more seats and punishing the well, well performing states uh, with fewer seats. So either you will just postpone the whole thing or you will adopt the American model where you will say that the lower house, the Lok Sabha, will have seats based on population. So you increase the seats. So shall we say UP goes up from 80 to maybe 100 and Kerala only goes up from 20 to 2 because that is the kind of population uh, change. But at the same time, in the Rajya Sabha, you increase the seats for Kerala. As in America, where the Congress, the lower house, has, I think, 400 odd representatives based on population. But every state has two senators in the Senate. So that the interests of the state are, are fairly represented. And there is not an unfair uh, advantage given to heavily populated states. But we'll have to see what happens. Now, I have, what I've tried to do in my lecture, and I, just, I have one or two uh, concluding comments, and then I'll end, is 
that we are a work in progress. We are a fascinating uh, ex political experiment in our diversity, in our depth, uh, in our daring and reckless adoption of a, of a democratic political system, defying all the odds. But we are still in work in progress. We have many att attended tasks. I have listed six challenges, the political, the institutional, the economic, the environmental, the majoritarian, and the regional. And we have to really consider these seriously as we go forward. And this is where the current general election is so important. It is my view as a historian that the best years for India, particularly with regard to the economy, but also with regard to federalism and the rights of states, were between 1991 and 2014, when we had coalition governments at the center. We did, we did not have a single party having a large majority. Uh, before that, when Rajiv Gandhi got 400 seats, uh, you can remember how arrogant he became. Uh, after 1989, and 89 to 91, we saw three governments, so it was slightly, com slightly complicated. <coughs> but, but 1991 onwards has been a time of steady economic growth, social harmony, respect for the rights of states, independent regulatory institutions. When there's a minority government at the center, when no single party has more than 250 seats, you will see even the Supreme Court gets bolder. You know, even the judges get more, uh, kind of more of a spine. So, we don't know what will happen in a few days, but if I was to offer a wish or a hope, it is that no party gets more than maybe 220, 230 seats, because that, I think, will give us a chance to renew our democracy, to restore our battered federal system, uh, to give trust to minorities, and to work together to build a more just, a more inclusive, a more harmonious, and a more economically robust India. Thank you very much. Thank you for my patience. And thank you especially for uh, uh, being with me, uh, for, for, um, for being so patient about the delay in my flight over which I had no control at all. Thank you.